So uh, you've probably heard uh, uh, Addison Snell give some of these presentations. And I like to say the difference between Addison and me is really the difference of the ways to do market research. There's one way in which you sit around and read annual reports and look at survey data and build models. And that's sort of what I do. The other way is just go out and talk to people and find out what's really going on. And that's what Addison does. However, every once in a while, someone leaves the gate unlatched and I sneak out. So uh, a little bit about uh, Intersect 360. Been around for 10 years. We cover high performance computing. And uh, now we're uh, also doing a hyperscale. Uh, Addison does a weekly podcast you might hear. Uh, we work with Top 500, and we're also a sponsor of this organization. A couple of times a year, you might see a uh, email from us asking you to fill out one of our surveys, and uh, we like to th I'd like to thank everyone who's done that and encourage everyone else to do that as well if they get the chance. Uh, reviewing sort of the last year, um, you're looking at high performance computing, basically systems sold to scientists and engineers, uh, being about a, a 35, 36 billion dollar market. Pretty good sized market overall. Um, and that's uh, growing at about 3.5 percent. Uh, uh, servers are the biggest part, but as we'll see, it also includes storage and software and lots of other pieces. Uh, and we're predicting it to grow around 4.3%. Moderate growth rate, a little bit better than inflation. Uh, this is one Addison put in. I usually do not refer to myself in the third person. Uh, when you create a forecast, it has to be bound by what is realistic. Unfortunately, reality does, has no such restrictions. And this is one of my favorite slides. I should explain it first. This is uh, history and forecast for the computer market by uh, servers, storage, services, software, networks, cloud, and, and other. And what you see here is really two parts. One is this part that's really jagged and goes up and down, and that's reality. That's history. Then right around 2016, it becomes nice and smooth. That's a forecast. We can't forecast the variabilities in the market, so we just head out there. Forecasts are basically a trend analysis. We ask users how much they think their budgets are going to grow over the next several years. We put that in. We talk to people, as I said, and we work from there. That's just the detailed numbers. Uh, any particularly exciting number here? Uh, server revenue grew. Super, everything grows here. Actually, this may be one of the few years that uh, servers gain share. Traditionally, they've been losing share mainly to software and storage. Uh, Cloud, I'm really tired about talking about cloud. It has not been a big piece of the HPC market. We can talk about that separately if you like. Uh, in this most recent survey, it did show a jump from about 3% to about 5%. So that is some movement that maybe methodology, we changed the question a little bit, uh, maybe uh, a few big people coming in and saying they did a lot of cloud. Or it may be a, a trend that's actually getting underway. We'll have to watch that. Uh, and we have another slide on this, but just to point out that uh, we do our forecast starting out by economic sector. And what we're seeing from mainly end user reports is that the public sector is government and academia are not getting a whole lot of money. Uh, at least not a whole lot of money growth. And I suppose that's not a surprise to anyone in this room. But uh, commercial industrial sites 
are picking up and becoming more and more enthusiastic about high performance computing and spending more money. Uh, breakdown, we have uh, 16 or 17 vertical markets uh, that we look at. And if we break it into the public sector, academia uh, is actually the largest segment if you consider it as a, as a vertical market, about 18%. The rest of government, national labs, national security, uh, various national agencies like the Institute of Health uh, would fall, it would be about a quarter of the market. And then everything else, 55.5% is commercial. Uh, and the two commercial segments that we're most interested in right now is first chemistry. Uh, we've been watching chemistry for a long time. We've been saying this really ought to be a breakout industry. There's been a lot of work done, particularly in the biosciences side, in molecular modeling. And industrial users really should begin to pick that up. Uh, and that in the uh, last year, we're beginning to see some additional sales. Interestingly enough, some of it comes from things like consumer product manufacturing. If you think of the pods for laundry detergent, the little things you pick up and toss into the bottom of your, uh, of your washer before you go, um, the casing of those is a chemical miracle in my opinion. It's absolutely mind boggling. It has to dissolve in cold water it has to remain solid the rest of the time, no matter what anybody does to it. And it has to last for a long time. And this is just to make it easier to put soap in your washing machine. That's how it goes. The other area we see growth is the financial sector. Uh, now this not only includes Wall Street for pricing and risk analysis and trading, but also the insurance industry. Uh, and uh, a lot of the general business segments that mainly deal with moving money around. Uh, I gotta tell you, I don't like this slide. Uh, if you've ever read how to lie with statistics, this slide shows up in it. Uh, the problem with this slide is it starts out with the size of the market in 2016 and calls that zero. And as we saw before, that was really 30 some billion, and then shows its growth. So it makes the growth look more dramatic than it, than it really is. But the important part is, is the difference in the blue part, which is public sector, and the orange part, which is industrial, uh, industrial commercial segments. Uh, that's really where we're seeing all the growth now, yeah. right at the moment. Uh, this is a strange slide, but I really like it. And I like it because it tells people why HPC is such a dynamic market. Uh, what we did a while back was ask people, essentially, if you could get more computer power, can you use it? And you read this, really look at the purple and blue segments. Those are the people that said, yes, we can. Green is sort of neutral, and the red and the dark blue are, no, we can't. So the first one we said is, do you have all the computer power you need right now? And just about everyone said no. Only about less than 15% said, yeah, pretty much we have all the power we need right now. Then we said, okay, what happens if you gave you twice as much power? Could you use it in five years? What we get? About 65% say, yep. Uh, we move up to 5x more power, 10x more power. And this is going up very slowly. Once we get up to 100x more power, people begin to get a little iffy. And 100x even more so. But still, even at 100x, most people are at least on the fence about whether they could do it. Uh, very few can, uh, markets of any type can
can absorb as much product as you can throw at it. And HPC is one of them. Uh, best metrics, this is kind of an eye chart uh, on what to use to sell, sell your computers to it. I would suggest you go and look at this. It's pretty much the usual suspects. Uh, so did the big players. HPE uh, really captured the uh, market share, uh, leadership this year. A lot of that's due to purchasing SGI. Purchase another company, you buy their share. Uh, Dell's doing very well. Lenovo is very interesting. They're coming around, particularly in Europe and Asia. Uh, they bought IBM's business a few years ago. They had a pretty bad year, time of it for the first year or so, and then are on a recovery track. IBM, four or five years ago, was the number one player. And it essentially exited the computer market. Uh, Cray's doing, uh, doing well, bull. The other thing is we begin to see a couple of Chinese companies show up. And I think as time goes by, those shares will increase. Storage revenue. Uh, let's see, there are some provisos here. This is a revenue is assigned to the uh, final seller as sold. Uh, so Dell EMC does very well, NetApp, HP, IBM. Uh, I really don't see any surprises in that data other than the number of companies and the very large group in the other category. Uh, what do we have? We have been looking more deeply into the uh, hyperscale market. Uh, we've always watched it initially. Uh, oh, do we have the definition there? We call the hyperscale by a different name, ultrascale internet computing. And then it grew and pretty much it became a segment so big that it began to dwarf the other segments. And we decided, well, maybe we needed to look at this on, it, on its own. Uh, we've been working on a methodology and uh, we're beginning to get some research results in. Uh, definition. Hyperscale market consists of arbitrarily scalable web-facing applications infrastructure that is distinct from general IT investment. So it has that same sort of growth characteristic that HPC has, which is no matter how much power you have, somebody can figure out what to do with it. HPC, you're gonna grow the system until you run out of science. Hyperscale, you're gonna grow systems until you run out of people in the world who wanna use the internet. The other important thing is it's not simply businesses that have websites. If you can run your web-facing applications on your standard business computer, it doesn't count. That's just business as normal. Uh, similarities and differences. I talked about some of the similarities. Uh, let's look at HPC yeah, for the differences. Uh, HPC is focused on performance. We've been hearing about that all day. Hyperscale is really scalability, how many different jobs you can run in a given amount of time, how much you can work stuff. Large jobs versus, versus multiple jobs. Uh, and this is in HPC, you can have an entry job. If you're a scientist and engineer and you're running on a four node system and you're designing a bolt or an interconnect, then yeah you're doing high performance computing. In our definition, there is no low level in hyperscale. Oh. And here's the one that's really scary. A big supercomputer facility is about $100 million plus. Multiple companies, six to eight, have budgets in the $1 billion. 
How many orders of magnitude is that? Two, three, um, one. But what that says is there is enough money here to restructure the overall computer market. It also says that the people who are calling the shots in defining technology are the hyperscale people. That used to be the HPC people. We're getting outspent on the HPC side. Uh, initial analysis on the size of the market. Uh, break it into tier one. Those guys with uh, about a billion dollars. Uh, it's interesting. We've, we have our eight companies. Uh, we've had it as high as nine or ten, and then companies have fallen out. This year, we might, that number might change slightly. Uh, but it's interesting that we talk to other people, and they'll give us other, other combinations of companies. A lot of them aren't as big as they seem to be. Uh, Tier two, about uh, 40 companies. We're assuming there's about another 100 at the uh, $5 billion side. Kind of boggles my mind to sit here and say somebody with a $5 billion budget is small. But we're in a different scale of market here. Uh, AI deep learning. Uh, we have just moved this into the hyperscale market. And yes, a lot of AI is being done in HBC. Actually, we have some new study results we haven't published yet, but uh, uh, roughly 75% of HPC sites have some involvement uh, with, uh, high perform uh, with uh, deep learning. And for the most part, don't remember the number is that this is being done with their internal budgets. Uh, there's a few mixed budgets and a very few new budgets altogether for deep learning sort of applications. Uh, it's not a, a vertical market in and of itself, but more of an algorithmic computational approach. It's almost like fast Fourier transforms. They, they pop up in lots of different places. Uh, uh, and we are following this closely. Uh, we've just done some survey work on it. Uh, we keep on getting asked to size it, so finally we gave in and, and, and uh, put together a model. Um, and you know, basically we're saying we used all the information we could find and uh, this is on the next slide. And pretty much it's uh, pretty much it's analyst opinion at this point. Uh, so we're placing the deep, uh, uh, deep learning market about two to two point five billion dollars right now. A lot of money's going into it. Um, represents about six point five percent of hyperscale. And uh, if you want to know more, you need to be a client. Um, right now, deep learning is somewhat like taking a room through, full of eight to 10 year olds and giving them all a can of spray paint and then walking out of the room. And then coming back 10, 10 minutes later and everything's covered with spray paint. Whatever you want painted is covered, the walls are covered, and the kids are covered. Uh, and what we've just done is we've taken all the computer scientists in the world and given them a deep learning can of spray paint. And they are out there covering the entire solution space with deep learning. That is not bad for the most part. First off, the things we want painted are gonna be painted very well. Uh, there are going to be a lot of things people look at and say, eh, no, we probably shouldn't have sprayed it on this. And, you know, and there's going to be a few, you know, things that may say, oh, gee, that was really bad. Uh, you know, I don't know what we're ever going to do with Betsy's shoes, but uh, for the most part, it's a good thing, but it is sort of a, 
uh, a, a general assault on all the possibilities. The other thing is, is that, you know, we expect a, a very high growth rate, uh, you know, doubling next couple of years. It's very hard to get anything to double for more than two years. Uh, eventually people run out of money. Uh, one of the first mistakes people make in forecasting is assuming there's an infinite pool of money, and, and there just isn't. Um, after that, it will moderate and possibly contract over the five-year period. Some of that is, the, is just the over-enthusiasm, overshooting the market. Some of it, I think, is the relationship between developing learning sets and uh, inference sets. That learning takes a lot of work and a lot of computing power, but it is not yet clear uh, to me at least, that how many times you have to relearn something. Once you get a good learning set completed of a language, do you really need to complete that process or do you just need to fine tune it every year or so to keep up with changes in pronunciation and, and words? And does that fine tuning require as much compute as the initial activity? So in that case, um, you know, you might see that, you know, there's just, we'll do every language in the world, and we'll do all the cats on the internet, and, you know, <laughs> sooner or later, uh, we'll begin to run out of those really big problems. Uh, what's not here is that the inference part of the market uh, may be the really strong part of the market overall. Uh, it's the, uh, sort of classic case of give the razor away and sell the razor blades. If you put inference engines in everything uh, that goes out the door, every product, then you may be selling a whole lot of inference engines along the way. Uh, and uh, how are we doing on time? Still 20 minutes. Hmm? 20 minutes? <laughs> 20 minutes? Oh, did Huh? He said five. <laughs> uh, we have a, a report we do at the end of the year called Top of the Top. And it's kind of a fun thing about who's the, sort of done best in the market. Uh, this is boilerplate talking about how we do the research. Uh, this is the definition of top. It's really hard to define top in any really consistent way across categories is what this says. And we have some rules. The one is that we get the rules and then sometimes we ignore them anyways. Um, so top systems, we've pretty much seen this one already. Uh, HP uh, is doing really well, followed by Dell. And after you get to five people, you've hit about, or five companies, uh, you've hit about 55% of the market. And there's the others. Uh, top accelerator vendors, there's two ways of looking at accelerators. Um, one is how many nodes have an accelerator in them. If you look at that, uh, how many systems, I'm sorry, have accelerators in them, you find that uh, there's only one top and that's NVIDIA. They have three quarters of the market. Uh, if you ask somebody if they have an accelerator and they say yes, you say, what is it? And it's NVIDIA. Uh, the other one is just to discount the total number of accelerators. And here, uh, NVIDIA is still the winner. And uh, Intel uh, showed up pretty strongly with the Phi processor. But um, that was only in about 15% of the systems. They got some really big sales. One of the problems in following HPC markets is that you can get a really big computer and it produces a really big outlier. It just overflows it. Back about eight or 10 years ago, if we did the market just analysis just right, every computer looked like a blue jean because they had so many nodes. Uh, I don't know what to tell you about X, Z on five, what Intel's plans are, it seems like they're uh, stepping back from it though, so 
uh, we may just have a couple of duplicate charts. Top storage, we pretty much, all, pretty much already hit. This is actually a little bit different because this is a perception one. This is, we ask people what their storage is, uh, which generally means the storage they're most excited about. So DDN, I think, shows up a little bit higher. Dell EMC, IBM comes in there very well. NetApp, uh, HP is a little lower. So if you compared the two charts, I think you'd see some differences. Um, I don't know about file systems. We see that IBM and DDN, in terms of the companies mentioned, who gives you your file system, are the leaders. And Lustre.org is uh, way down there at the bottom with, uh, with Dell and Intel in the middle. But when we look at what is your file system, uh, Lustre and uh, SpectraScale and derivatives, the IBM products, are in a dead tie. And that's pretty much the effect of open source uh, versions of, uh, uh, of Lustre. Uh, PanFS, uh, interesting that NFS still shows up, I think with about a 3% share of the market there. Uh, interconnects, uh, this is interesting. There are three ways to look at interconnect technology. Uh, the first one is um, interconnects inside a system, inside a cluster. And the winner there is, is Mellanox. And there's only one other real competitor, which is Intel. Uh, Mellanox is 44%. The second way is your storage interconnect. Cluster to storage system. Once again, Mellanox comes out. And Cisco uh, proves to be number two. Does anyone think about Cisco in HPC? They, Cisco doesn't. We call them up periodically and say, you know, you're doing really well in HPC. And they say, so what? <laughs> uh, and then finally, uh, uh, top land suppliers. And here, you know, Cisco just blows it out because, well, they're everywhere. You know, if you have an Ethernet, you very likely have some Cisco equipment there. But interestingly enough, Mellanox shows up as number two. Mellanox appears in all three of these. Uh, what else? I guess you guys are interested in software. This is looking at sources of middleware. And that uh, breaks out just about evenly between open source and ISVs. Uh, this chart here is kind of interesting because depending upon the segment you're in, the uh, sources change somewhat. Commercial uses much more ISV than academia, and government's kind of in between. Where we see this play out in a much greater degree is in application software. It's the same sort of chart, but the uh, differences between the bars are much different. Uh, top primary middleware by category. And this one really fascinates me in that Programming environments and compilers combine about 56%. I don't think in any other part of the market could you get software development software as being the majority of the middleware you found. Uh, scientists, engineers like to do some programming. And just about everyone has some. And they think it's important that they have it. The question we actually ask here is, list your top five primary middleware packages. So these things are up there in what they think their most important software is. Uh, uh, MATLAB from MathWorks is a big programming environment. One, uh, Slurm, which is highly addictive. Uh, is the uh, job management one, and the GNU compiler collection comes in high as well. Uh, 
on the application side. And this is kind of interesting in that the other category is the biggest slice. Now, about a third is taken up by the 10 top companies. Um, these are both open source and ISV, generally available means not written yourself. So if you can go out and buy it or download it, it's included here. If somebody wrote a package in the, uh, and runs it in-house, we don't count it. Uh, so it's about 75%, about three quarters of the applications uh, are generally available. And uh, it's all the usual suspects. Uh, chemistry, fluid dynamics, structural analysis, weather. Weather shows, a wharf shows up uh, pretty strongly, about 3%. Um, and even the, the top one shows up at only 4%. Uh, and summary, uh, HP, uh, is doing well. NVIDIA comes through with a lot of the awards, sort of we wanted to do a listing of the medal winners and Mellanox. Uh, all were big winners in, in the market last year. So that's it. Is there any questions? Chris, a great had some bad, uh, bad year and they're saying the market is very soft, but they seem to be the only ones complaining. <laughs> <laughs> I have not yet. Uh, I, will, uh, I will be sitting down very shortly and pouring over a lot of annual reports. So ask me in a month or so. Uh, that uh, craze market is traditionally much more volatile. A lot more, a lot more variability in it because selling big machines and you can't get around it. They don't have any, any smaller machines to kind of provide a, a cushion for them. Um, and if the budgets aren't there one year, uh, they suffer and hope that next year all the budgets will come in and, uh, and things will be good again. The delay of Aurora. Uh, I'd be a better one for Addison. I'll give you my personal take, which is from my point of view, uh, a delay of a single system does not make much of a bump in the market overall. Uh, and that is because I'm looking at everything from $50,000 up. And we did not have the uh, part, of the, part of the business that, uh, part of the, uh, the chart which breaks things up by large, medium, small, extra large. Uh, and that when we do that, the supercomputing market uh, is probably about 15, 20% overall. So one system in the 15, 20% category, uh, you know, I'm not gonna change my forecast based on that. I think, uh, I guess the answer to that is all of the above. Uh, no, I really think that there is a, a strong deep learning market. I think that, um, that it is technology that has a lot of uses that it's going to grow and expand. I think in five years we're gonna be surprised at all the things people have figured out to do with deep learning. I think there's also an awful lot of enthusiasm. I think on top of that, just general di market dynamics. 
I have never seen a market grow or double more than two years in a row. And that I don't think uh, deep learning will either. I might be surprised, but I think a couple of years of very, very strong growth. And then, uh, you know, then you just run out of money. It levels out, people don't stop buying. You may get a dip, you may have overshot the market, but it's still gonna be there. Uh, it might decline for a few years. I, uh, I would say that that decline is, isn't going to be uh, uh, particularly dramatic. Uh, people will be upset if it stops growing, but that might happen, but a few percent. Uh, one hundred percent analyst opinion here. I think they will continue to buy. Uh, well, let's see. Let me let's figure out what we mean by their own chip. Will they design a chip and send it to a foundry uh, versus buy a different uh, a regular architecture? Uh, I think you will probably see a little bit more send a chip to a foundry, but not much. I think what you will see instead is them going to the chip man manufacturers and say, hey, if you put this feature in, we'd really like it. And I think that's happening already, actually. I've been told that. And I think that's much more likely to be the path it takes. Uh, is there another, you know, another tensor chip coming down the line? Uh, you know, I don't think so. I think companies do that when they're so far ahead of the market that they can't wait for it to catch up. And unless another technology like deep learning comes up that they get way ahead of, that they won't need to do that. They can just nudge the manufacturers in their direction. Okay, if it is a, say a chip within a, an automobile and they need 10 million of those, that is an embedded system. So APC would not include We would not include embedded systems. Uh, it just gets too far afield. Uh, whole, uh, whole different area of market research. I tried to get into it once and got warned off. Guy with a shotgun. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Quantum computing? Quantum computing is fascinating in that we are seeing a great deal of, uh, of research going in there. I personally think it's uh, a couple of things from the HPC side. One is, is that they, you know, look, Moore's Law has, has leveled out. Uh, it's hit the wall, whatever. And people are saying, well, we can't, the free ride's over we're gonna to have to go and start finding new ways to solve the next generation of problems. And I think that people are saying, well, okay, we're gonna to have to invest at some level and that's driving it. And at the same time, I think people probably feel they have a lot less influence on the HPC side with the standard vendors now that the hyperscale people are around. Um, It is unclear to me at this point what the application set is for quantum computing. Uh, it does seem that people are working towards it. I expect it will, it will begin to grow and show up, but it's still too early. And I have yet to get an explanation of quantum computing that I can really understand. 
So I can't make a, a strong case for it one way or the other. Uh, nice technology uh, when we see some real interesting applications come out and the sizes come out. That's fine. We you know the, the chemistry ones seem to be the best, but it almost seems to be uh, setting up a quantum chemical inside your computer and seeing what it does. Okay. Well, th oh, one more. Do you see a change in job profiles for HPC sites? Do we see a change in? Oh, job profiles. Uh, that is a question. That is a question. <laughs> that is a question we don't ask. I guess that falls into a good question being defined as one that the uh, uh, speaker doesn't have a good answer for. Uh, <laughs> uh, the only thing we hear about is data science as as being in demand, but uh, that that's popular press. Um, I, don't, I don't think the job profiles are really making that big a difference right now other than being really smart and willing to do the work. Um, what we, you know, what we see, uh, you know, first of all, I don't really have any technology predictions. I can tell you what we see historically, which is that all the forms of Ethernet take up about 50% of the market. And that then the other 50% has periodically gone by in waves of new technology. And right now, that's mainly um, uh, InfiniBand. With Omnipath coming in, we'll have to see how well that actually penetrates the market. Um, and it really, uh, I think it really depends on how, how well InfiniBand can keep up uh, with the technology to keep ahead. Uh, certainly, there are always going to be people out there with new ideas. And, uh, try, and trying to bring them out. And maybe something wonderful will happen. Okay. Thank you very much.